If you would join me this morning in John chapter 1, Ed read the first 18 verses, the prologue to John's book. We're going to focus primarily, the main point of the passage is verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. J.I. Packer was right when he wrote in his classic book, Knowing God, that the most incredible biblical teaching to believe is not the resurrection of Jesus Christ, rather it is His incarnation. Once a person believes that Almighty God took on flesh and bones and blood. Once a person believes that God became a man, then everything else in the Bible is easy to believe. If God became man, then it's easy to believe that he lived a perfectly sinless life. If God became man, then it's easy to believe that he died a righteous, substitutionary, and therefore acceptable death on behalf of sinners. If God became man, then it's easy to believe that he rose from the dead. They now intercedes for his own at the Father's right hand. So if someone's going to stumble over a New Testament truth, it shouldn't be the resurrection. It should be this incredible miracle of the incarnation. And the Apostle John knew that. He knew that, and that's why I think he opens his book, this Gospel of John, with 18 verses to focus on the incarnation, to focus on the fact that God became a man. One day I planned to preach through the book of John, and the theme of the book of John is in chapter 20, verse 31. John says, I've written these things so you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life through his name. He tells us in chapter 20, and verse 30, that he could have written a lot more, so when he begins... This, let, this, this gospel begins to emphasize the incarnation. We can assume that it's a very, very vital truth. Of all the things that he could have begun with, he begins with, begins with the incarnation. Unlike Matthew and Luke, John does not record the so-called Christmas story. Unlike Mark, he doesn't begin with the ministry of John the Baptist. But he begins by going back to prehistory, and showing us something of the pre-incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Four times in the prologue, he speaks about the word. And there is a reason for that. Because those familiar with the Old Testament, which John would assume his Hebrew Jewish readers would be familiar with, they know that the word was that which was by God created everything. It was by his word that God makes himself known. It is by his word that he heals and delivers his people. It is by his word that God judges, and it's by his word that he displays his wisdom. Let me summarize all of this by saying that John wants his readers to come to see and to believe that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of history, is God. That he is the I am revealed in the old covenant to Moses, the I am that I am. That Jesus Christ is the one who precedes and the one who pervades and the one who ordains history. He is the I am of Christmas. May we marvel at that and may we believe that. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, you are outside of Christ, you're an unbeliever, then you need to see and believe this truth. You need to be amazed and you need to be humbled by the truth that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you need to believe that He is the Word who in the first century was made flesh and who for 33 years dwelt amongst His own creation, proving who He is. Ultimately, not so much by His life, though that does point to his deity, but to his sacrificial death that was accepted by God, and we know is accepted because he 
was raised from the dead. Several years ago, I preached a Christmas morning sermon on Matthew 1.21, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That is the message of Christmas. Christians, we need to constantly live absorbed in the truth of the Incarnation. We need to remember, to reflect, to rejoice, and rely on the truth that Jesus Christ is the great I Am. And as we do, we will be humbled and hungry to worship Him. As we realize that Jesus Christ was not just a man, but He was the God-man, we will be humbled and happy to walk with Him. We'll be humbled and honored to work for Him. And in all of this, we will continually set our hope in Him. And to that end, I want to give a very, very brief explanation of this opening prologue and then spend some time, very importantly, on applying the truth that the, of the I am of Christmas. John, again, his pivotal statement is verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. By the time we get to verse 14, John wants us to be prepared for the amazing truth that this word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He begins in the first five verses of introducing us to this word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. There never was a time when Jesus Christ was not God. There's never been a time where Jesus Christ was not He's co-equal and therefore co-existent with God. He is the one who is the creator, we're told in verse 3. All things were made through him, and without, without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ, the Word, the Son of God, the one that John is introducing his readers to, the one that John is reminding us of, was the one who created everything. G.K. Chesterton said over a century ago, the hands of the one who had created the sun and the stars were too small at his birth to reach the heads of the cattle. Here was Jesus Christ who had created the cattle. He created the wood that the manger was made from. And here he is lying in that manger, but he is the creator of all things. We're told that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He's still speaking of those early days of creation. And what what John is saying is that when everything was created by Jesus Christ, he's the one who breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and Adam became a living soul. It is through Jesus Christ we all had the light of the knowledge of a God, of the great I Am and therefore responsible for that. He then kind of has a parenthetical statement in verses 6 to 8, speaking about John the Baptist, who was called to, who was sent by God to proclaim this word, who is the light, so that all men through him might believe in him. I was at the hospital this week with Jill, who was having some procedures, and I saw one of the sisters that I had come to know quite well when I was in hospital, and she was a Christian, she would come and she would read scripture to me sometimes and pray with me. And she was always sharing with me how she had shared the gospel that day with somebody. And when I saw her, and her last words to me this week were, and don't forget the Great Commission. John was sent with the Great Commission to proclaim Jesus Christ the light of the world. That is still our commission. John proclaims. It's interesting uh, how John The apostle makes the point that John the Baptist was not that light. And it's interesting that he even has to make that statement. But that just shows that Jesus Christ was a human being. And as Isaiah said, there was nothing outwardly about him that would cause anyone to stop and say, wow, he looked like a normal man. This is the word that was made flesh. He speaks about The true light in verse 9, which gives light to everyone who was coming to the world. He was in the world. Jesus Christ came into this world, and the world was made through him. It repeats that, yet the world did not know him. 
He came to his own. He came to his own creation. He came to his own people, and they did not receive him. He experienced great humiliation, and only, not only did not receive him, but they crucified him. But you're given this wonderful positive note. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, came to be the Savior of the world. With all that background, and I think John is assuming that his readers are going to read this over and over again. In the early days, they're going to listen to it over and over and over again. And as we contemplate that Jesus Christ was the one who has created everything, that Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent with God, the triune God, that he's the second member of of the Godhead. When we realize all of that, and we realize he came into this world and he was rejected, when we realize who he is, verse 14 stands out. And think about this. This word, John says, that I've been describing, he became flesh. I was thinking this morning about the reality of that. That here is God in the flesh, in the womb of Mary. This is God in the flesh, traveling through the birth canal of Mary. This is God in the flesh, who when he comes forth, looks a mess. You ever been there when your wife gave birth? It's a beautiful thing, and a not so beautiful thing. Think about that. The Word, the great I Am, became flesh. And He dwelt amongst us. The word dwelt is a word that could be translated, He tabernacled amongst us. I think John is deliberately picking up on that Old Testament uh, concept of the tabernacle, which was the dwelling place of God. And the Word, the great I Am, became flesh. And he dwelt among us. And because he dwelt among us, we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father. Having just come to the book of Numbers, perhaps it's fresh in our minds, that the one thing about the tabernacle was it was about God's presence amongst God's people. But it was God's very guarded presence amongst his people. In fact, God wanted to guard his people from his glory so much that he surrounded the temple of the tabernacle with the Levites, so that lest someone would come near and die, Numbers 1, 53. And over and over again, you see that in Numbers, where there is this danger of people coming so close to the transcendent God that they would actually be destroyed. That there was a sense in which, though God was present with them in the tabernacle, there was also a huge sense in which he was unapproachable. Dangerous. In Exodus chapter 3, God appears to Moses as, that, as, a, fiery, as a fire in that bush that, that would not be consumed. And as the Lord appears, and then Moses says, who should I tell has sent me? And God says, tell him the I am that I am has sent you. Later on in chapter 33, Moses says, Lord, I want to know you. I want to see you. And God basically says to him, you can only see my back parts because if you see me, you will die. And his glory passes by Moses. And it's interesting that glory passes by by the proclamation of God's name, the proclamation of his word, which tells us who he is. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's long-suffering, he's just, and he will by no, no, no means clear the guilty. But now we have this astounding truth that the I am becomes flesh. And John says he dwelt amongst us. In fact, John in 1 John writes and says, let me tell you that we've not only seen him, not only have we heard him, but we have handled him. We have touched the I am. 
He dwelt among us, and we've even seen His glory. You see, the transcendent at the incarnation, the transcendent became tangible. The transcendent became touchable. The unapproachable became approachable. As we saw in the book of Numbers, you had to be extremely clean to get anywhere near the tabernacle. If you were a leper, you could not come near the tabernacle. If you touched a dead person recently, you could not come near the, the tabernacle. Yet, think about in the gospel accounts where Jesus Christ reaches out and he touches lepers. He touches the dead. Jesus Christ, the great I am, has come to earth. And in the incarnation, he has made God approachable. The incarnation is the greatest of miracles. And again, that's why J.I. Packer is right. Once you believe that, everything else becomes very easy to believe. The sovereign God, the sovereign source of everything, this supreme light that offers himself as a savior to a world, this savior who's been rejected, this God became a man. I think John desires that his readers, again, contemplate this truth and realize the great invitation that God is giving. For he says in verse 16, For from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus, he has made him known. The, invitation, the, the incarnation is God's great invita invitation to a lost and dying, darkened world to come and to experience the light of life. John, by saying the Word became flesh, is telling us that the great I Am became a man. Now, that phrase... I am is very, very important to John. And this is what I've been laboring to get to. John has structured his gospel around seven signs or seven miracles. I won't go into what those are. But there's two other sets of sevens that John uses very deliberately. And the first one is this, and you're familiar with it. Seven times Jesus says, I am the. I am the bread of life, chapter 6. I am the light of the world, chapter 9. I am the door of the sheep, chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life, chapter 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life, chapter 14. In chapter 15, I am the vine. In all those statements, what Jesus is saying is, I am everything that you need. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who can satisfy you above all satisfaction. And by the way, can I just say this on Christmas? Because Christmas can be so robbed of its importance by sentiment and everything else. I plan to go home after this service and unwrap some presents. I hope to unwrap a lot of presents. <laughs> And I will enjoy those presents. I've already unwrapped my stocking. And I'll be seeing Anton in about a month with dental problems. But as much as we're going to enjoy being with family, as much as we're going to enjoy the gifts and all that, none of that can ultimately satisfy us. It's Sunday, but Monday's coming. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the one who satisfies you completely. When he said, I am the light, what he was saying is, I am the one who shines on you and shows you the way back to God. When he said, I am the door of the sheep, he was saying, I'm the one who gives security to my people. I protect them. When he said, I am the good shepherd, he was fulfilling Psalm 23 and saying, I am the one who saves my people and leads them all the way. 
When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he was saying, I am your only hope of spiritual life. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying, I am the way to God. When he said, I am the vine, he was saying, I am the true vine, I am the true Israel. I'm the one who's fulfilled all the promises, and in me you will find your fulfillment and your abundance. Those are quite enormous claims. Because in all those seven sayings of I am the, fill in the blank, Jesus was saying that I am the hope of the world. I am the only one who can save you. So that's a great claim. But the question is, can he back it up? And I say that reverently. And that's a fair question to a reader of John's Gospel. Here's Jesus making all these claims. And lots of people throughout history have made those claims, by the way. Can he fulfill it? Well, that's where the other seven I am's come in in the book of John. There are seven unique uses of a Greek phrase, ego I me, I am, in John. That a Hebrew reader, particularly reading John, would catch. And they would realize that Jesus Christ, by using this phrase, I am, was claiming to be God. In John chapter 4, verses 24 to 26, speaking to the woman at the well, he said to her, I who speak to you am he. Literally in the Greek, I am. I who speak to you, I am. In John 6, 19 to 20, when he, call, he walks on the sea and he comes to the boat, he says to them, do not be afraid. It is I, literally in the Greek, I am. In John 8, 23 to 24, he said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In John 13, 18 to 19, I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am. And you remember in John 18, when, when the soldiers from the temple come to arrest Jesus, and these soldiers from the temple would have been Hebrew soldiers. They come, and, 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 and Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And what do they do? They fall to the ground. And twice more he says to them, I am. It's extremely significant. Jesus didn't just claim to be a man, he claimed to be God. The I am that I am. The God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. And so when John writes in his prologue, and the Word became flesh, there is this, there's this concept in his mind that the I am became the I am the bread. The I am became, I am the light. The I am became, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am became the door to the sheep. The I am became the good shepherd. The I am became the resurrection and the life. The great I am became, I am the vine. If Jesus of Nazareth if Jesus laid in a manger, if Jesus born of a virgin were not God, then his promised I am thus would all be empty. He would not be able to save us. But because Jesus is the great I am, because he is God Almighty, we are assured that Jesus is both great and he's good. That he's not only willing to save us, but he's able to save us. He's not only meek, but he is majestic. We can conclude that by the word becoming flesh, we can be confident to receive Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Think about this, dear Christian. In Jesus, the I am became the all-sufficient, 
all-satisfying bread of life that we all need. And so on this Christmas, remember that you tru- what you truly need. Remember that Jesus does satisfy his people. You know, a year ago today, I was in ICU. And I, in place of a Christmas feast, I had a feeding tube in my chest. And in place of being with the family, one by one, they would come in, spend a few moments and see me. And Joe and I were talking a lot about that this week. And I said to her, it's funny, when I look back last year's Christmas, I don't look back at that as some great sad thing. In some ways, last Christmas was one of the most significant Christmases I've ever had. Because I didn't have all the extras. And so, in a first, for the first time in my life, there was a sense in which, what is this all about? And there's a reminder of what it's all about. And there's a reminder that Jesus does satisfy his people. And Jesus, the I am, became the light that though rejected by many, nevertheless is seen by his elect. And so on this Christmas, remember that apart from the word becoming flesh, you and I would still be in darkness. Yet because the word became flesh, you and I had the light of life. And Jesus, the I am, became the door through which his sheep could enter into his fold and be safe and secure forever. So this Christmas, reflect and rejoice that by the word becoming flesh, you need not be anxious of ever again being lost. Can I say that again? If you're a Christian, you never again need to worry about being lost. Jesus, Yahweh, the I Am, became the good shepherd who laid down his life for a sheep so that we could in fact come through this door. This Christmas, rejoice that by the word becoming flesh, we can confidently pray, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Jesus, the I am, became the resurrection and the life, meaning that though we were spiritually dead, he was powerful and able to give us new life. This Christmas, reflect and be its spiritual and emotional rest, that because the word became flesh, he could die in our place, securing our spiritual and our physical resurrection. He secured our immortality. And Jesus, the I am, became the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, unambiguously and absolutely bringing us to reconciliation with himself, this Christmas, remember where you would be if the word had not become flesh, groping for a way to God which would end in certain eternal death. And finally, in Jesus, the I am became the true vine that pleased Yahweh and in whom we can please him as well. This Christmas, remember that at one time we were outcast, cut off from God, but now in Christ, the Father accepts us. And when the word became flesh, Yahweh was assuming and assuring that his vine would be full and fruitful and finally faithful one day. John wrote, And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. You say, that's great, Doug. I'm glad that John and the disciples could see his glory, but Jesus, is he dwelling amongst us today physically? Well, obviously not. There's a wonderful truth that Paul picks up in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. When he comes to the end of that chapter, he writes, about the glory of the new covenant. And he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What's he talking about? What he is saying is, it's because we have the writing of John. It's because we have the writings of the apostles. It's because we have our Bibles that every day we can be confronted with the glory of Jesus Christ. I was shocked yesterday to read. I'm being kind of, I'm not Mr. Social Media. I was shocked to find out there's a big been a big debate in America whether or not churches should gather on Christmas Day. Because after all, 
It's a family day. Hello, family. Right? There's something tragic about professing Christians who wouldn't want to gather on Christmas, the day we we celebrate that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, particularly when it's on the Lord's Day. Well, I say all that to say this. Read your Bibles today. When we go home as a family today, we'll we'll read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2, praying that the Lord will show us His glory. As we end this year and begin a new year, may your prayer be what my prayer is, that in the most profound and new way, I will see the glory of the Word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. May God give us that kind of a Christmas day. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. It's a mystery. We spent several weeks in Family Bible Hour trying to explain it, and I think most of us left that feeling it's still a huge mystery. And yet it's revealed to us. The great I am became a man and lived a perfect life and died a sinless death and rose from the dead for our justification. Help us as Christians today to celebrate that true purpose of Christmas. And oh God, may unbelievers today turn to you. May they turn to you and find you as the full and final satisfaction that they need. The one who forgives. The one who secures reconciliation with you. May this be a day of conversions. A day of Christ being honored through the salvation of his people. And we ask these things in his name. Amen.